Okay, this is the first of three mini lectures on God and Empire. This is where we're going to talk a lot more about political morphism and its relationship to monotheism. And we're going to use ancient Judaism as our primary example, but not the only one. So here in part one, we're going to talk about what is monotheism and uh, compare a couple different versions of that in different spaces. Um, so the first thing we want to remind ourselves, if you go back to this little religion tree, is that we go from belief in the soul through these various uh, changes depending upon the culture or the society and uh, the shape of that society, but also what that society finds sacred. And then it can lead to, uh, from full humanization and polytheism, it can lead to multiple outcomes, um, not none of which are more advanced or superior to others. They're just different. Uh, so <clears throat> our first example of ancient monotheism actually comes from Egypt. Um, Egypt was a polytheistic society, but uh, <clears throat> they did develop a, uh, a pantheon with a king of the gods, and that would make that solidly henotheism. Um, Ra and Amun, uh, or the sun god, became the king of the Egyptian pantheon, and you can see it in the names of various um, figures. If they have Amun, they're attributing the ruler's name or the ruler's position in society to his um, analogous role uh, to the sun god. So that's henotheism. That's when there is a king of the gods. When you think of the Greek pantheon, you're probably thinking of Zeus being the king of the gods. That is closer to henotheism than a strict monotheism. Henotheism can develop into monolatry, um, as in the case uh, of an unusual pharaoh who, so the last pharaoh we mentioned was Amenhotep uh, III in particular, and uh, his son Amenhotep IV became pharaoh, and uh, Amenhotep IV didn't really dig the worship of Amun-Ra and the entire pantheon. And instead, he had a very specific relationship to a different sun god, which was not a personified deity so much as a more abstract deity uh, that specifically he invoked the, the sun disk. Right, So not the figure of Amun-Ra, uh, but the disk itself, as in the sun that you see in the sky. And that was referred to as Aten. So Aten was also a sun god. And during his reign, uh, Amenhotep IV renamed himself Akhenaten. Right? Uh, so again, his name con contains the deity to which he uh, pledges fidelity. And he raised Aten to the status of a preferred god. Now, you can't go about that by making a uh, henotheism because Aten can't become the king of the gods if Amun-Ra is. So instead, he took the route of monolatry. So this is a case where henotheism, uh, <coughs> the same god who is the king of the gods, does not become the preferred god. In this case, uh, Aten becomes Akhenaten's preferred deity. And he gets elevated, or it, this deity, gets elevated to the status of more powerful than all other gods and therefore a patron of Egypt. Um, but this doesn't really go down great. People are a little bit uncomfortable, but they are like, oh, whatever, he's a pharaoh and he's, you know, part divine and he's in charge. So they roll with it. Uh, but then he goes full on monotheism and people do not like it. They do not like it at all. And he does like revisionist monotheism where Aten becomes the only deity that exists. So worship of all other deities is illegal in Egypt on pain of death. And the Egyptians do not like this. They do not like being told that they cannot worship the, the gods of their ancestors and the gods of their household. Um, and so when, when he, oh, oops, when he ultimately dies, uh, um, um, his, uh, his son, whom he names after himself, Akhenaten, uh, actually rearranges everything. And so not only does it go back to, um, polytheism or henotheism, more like with the worship of Amun-Ra, 
Um, but his own son changes his name back to contain uh, Amun within it instead of Aten, and he became he becomes uh, Jesus uh, Tutankhamun, uh, which is he does not become Jesus. Uh, he becomes Tutankhamun or King Tut, uh, as far as we can tell. Um, there is some controversy on that, interestingly enough, but it has to do with relationships between tombs and DNA and stuff. Um, but as we know it, that happens to be the early history of monotheism. Um, the worship of Aten is actually the first version of monotheism that we know of in um, the world. And so the next one is Zoroastrianism. Um, Zoroastrianism in, emerges in what is modern day Iran. And it is specifically, it it is a bizarre um, seemingly out of nowhere emergence of monotheism from a polytheistic culture. So in polytheism or in the polytheism of early Persia uh, or what will become Persia, there is a pantheon that's very similar to the Vedic gods that we know in India who later become associated with Hinduism asterisk and there's some more going on with that we'll talk more about it when we talk about syncretism um, but that's a key feature is um, the Vedic pantheon and then there's Zoroaster or Zarathustra as you might uh, know him if you read any Nietzsche and he comes up with a totally different system of belief um, so it's oh <laughs> I had this in the slide already um the the gods in the Iranian pantheon are abstract as opposed to nature deities like we see in other pantheons. Um, and Zarathustra was born into their priestly class and initiated into the priesthood. And then he had this, you know, vision in a wilderness like prophets do. And it was from a god that was not in the pantheon. And that god claims to be the only god. And not not the one that climbs the tower from henotheism to monolatry uh, to monotheism. This is a totally different god, kind of an unknown god. And he is they, the god, the god is referred to as Ahura Mazda, meaning the wise lord. It's not a name, but a descriptor. So this god does not have a particular name. Uh, and evocations of Ahura Mazda are wisdom, truth, power, love, unity, and immortality. And you'll notice that these, these elements are also similar to the non-nature deities that populated the Vedic pantheon, but they're not individual gods. And it's really important that they are not aspects of Ahura, Ma Ahura Mazda, uh, which you might see in Hinduism, for example, in which aspects of the same god are embodied in different personas. Uh, but these are six substances that make up the essence of Ahura Mazda. So Zarathustra becomes essentially the world's first prophet, the first person who claims that they can speak directly to God, the only God, and has the only truth about that God. And he wrote those words down. <laughs> this was not popular, however. <laughs> uh, and part of it became was the difficulty of understanding the system. And in particular, how could one single God be the source of both good and evil? So... Zarathustra's logic here was that good and evil must coexist. And so there has to be this duality, even within Ahura Mazda. Um, and this is the foundation of a dualistic cosmology in which there's two aspects of Mazda. There's the spirit of good and the spirit of evil, right? Spenta you and Angra you. This concept of a dualistic God and a dualistic universe brings about several concepts that don't exist yet in any religion anywhere at all that we can tell. Um, heaven and hell, totally not a part of the practice of Judaism and the worship of their deity at the time. Uh, the, also the idea of the afterlife as one of judgment for actions during life that emerges from Zoroastrianism and the logical corollary that there must be different afterlives for those who do different, differently valued actions during their lifetime on earth. Um, 
in most other belief systems, the afterlife becomes kind of an extension of the current life uh, or, or just a, a shadow place uh, where an underworld where souls go after this life. Um, the other thing that this introduces is angels and demons. So if God is only one, uh, but there are other deities in these pantheons, they get demoted down from the level of deities to either angel or demon, depending upon whether they're more aligned with good or evil. So this allows our Astrianism not to deny their existence, um, but to incorporate it into the new system. Um, so like Atenism, the entire religion, which never really took off, died with Zarathustra. When Zarathustra died, so did any organized system for believing in his monotheism. And it doesn't really come back until the, come on, um, thank you. <laughs> I thought those were all coming at once. Until the sixth century BCE, which is Cyrus the Great, um, the first major empire of um, Persia. And one of the key things that he did is he wanted to have a distinctly Persian belief system that wasn't borrowed, especially from Mesopotamia, right? So what was happening in Mesopotamia at the time was the pantheon of gods pertained to city-states, right? And each city-state was essentially um, patronized by their own preferred deity. And when two city-states went to war, if one conquered the other, then the conquered deity ceased to not exist but ceased to be worshipped um, and the city then began to worship the deity of their conquerors because obviously that deity is more powerful or they wouldn't have been conquered um, and that's kind of the logic of the pantheon in much of the middle east in especially well what is now called the middle east right but especially mesopotamia and the fertile crescent all the way over to the mediterranean um, so cyrus when he is performing his conquest, if you will, um, he decides that his empire is too good and he is too great to have a um, patron deity that anyone else worships. And so he locates a tradition that is very specifically Persian and was not popular when it emerged um, and sort of revives Zoroastrianism and makes it the official state religion of his empire. Uh, but the version of it that he uses isn't really a strict monotheism. It's more of a monolatry, uh, but it's kind of walking the line between monotheism and monolatry because what he really wants to do is invalidate the religious belief systems of his enemies and to essentially set Persia up as the one true um, the one the one true culture with the access to the one true God and therefore the one true king or emperor um, so that's Zoroastrianism so now we get to what is ancient Judaism and one of the key things that's really important to remember and I'm sure there's going to be a quiz question on it haven't written the quiz yet but ding 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 pay attention to this um, Judaism is not originally monotheistic um, it is also monolatrous very similarly to the other religions that are being practiced in Canaan at the time um, like other Canaanites they worship a god from the Canaanite pantheon his name is El uh, the God that Moses meets in the wilderness, right? So we have the Canaanites, we have the early Canaanites, and we have um, early biblical books from Job, Genesis, um, all the way through Abraham and Isaac and uh, Jacob, right? So those early patriarchs, all of those guys are worshiping a God named El. And then there's the exile in Egypt in which the Hebrews are enslaved according to their narrative and when Moses escapes Egypt and he's in the wilderness and he encounters a burning bush the god that he meets there is named Yahweh right so El was the Canaanite deity and that is who the Hebrews brought with them when they fled into Egypt with uh, with Joseph they fled starvation uh, and when Moses runs out into the into the wilderness and he finds and ends up marrying a Midianite woman, uh, he worship, worships their family's gods. And those gods were separate deities in the 
ancient uh, Near East. And what's interesting is the way that they get kind of combined into one with the history of the Jews. But the key thing here is that early on, there is more than one deity and the, the Hebrews worship their preferred deity until Moses comes along and then he worships a different God. Um, <clears throat> examples of how this, uh, how we see this in the scriptures, and we're going to talk more about how these developed, um, is the word El, the name for this God, is built into a lot of the place names, especially in the Hebrew language. So you have Israel, which is El Preserves, and you have El Shaddai, El of the Mountains, and El Olum, El Everlasting, and El Roy, El Who Sees, El Elyon, El Most High, and that is what's usually translated as the Lord in your modern English Bibles. Uh, but then you also have Yahweh, and when you see the word God in your modern English Bibles, that's usually because the root word was Yahweh instead of El. So we have the names of both of these gods being used in the early scriptures and the relationship between them is not totally clear. So we'll talk more about what that looked like um, when we get to the history of the scriptures. But for now, just remember that there in the written texts, there are two names for God, and they come from two deities that used to be separate. Um, and then the other deities of the Canaanite pantheon also found themselves worshipped at different times in the temple, which is Baal, Ashura, Badat. All three of those were worshipped in the Jewish temple and not always condemned as such. Um, so we'll get a little bit more into that. But the key thing here is that clearly the ancient Hebrews believed in a pantheon. They just believed that their God was at the top of it. Um, monotheism does not become a thing for Judaism until, until that uh, moment when the Jews are conquered by Babylon and the Babylonian god Marduk essentially would have to replace the El in their belief system or Yahweh and that was totally untenable and that's worth talking about why that was. Um, so now the Israelites find themselves attached to the worship of El even though the logic of the system suggests that they should change to worshiping Marduk, right? Um, and so at this point they need a a god that is bigger than a tribal god uh, who can be defeated in battle, right? So for review, monotheism emerges at different times at different places, and the first two takes really did not stick. So 1349 BCE, that's Aten, and then Zoroaster, uh, 250 years later, and then almost 600 years, no, 500 years later. Um, then, then you see Judaism take a turn for the monotheistic. And this is the first major monotheism that really sticks. So that is part one. I'm going to stop here, uh, short early version.